Viva España! The whole brigade cried out. Stepping forward, the men of the 74th Native Infantry Regiment advanced towards the enemy lines. Ahead of them was Noveleta, a well-known stronghold of the rebels. It was a vital town, and the men of the 74th knew that the enemy would defend it to the last man. It was going to be a tough fight, but none of them hesitated. They had fought tougher battles before in this campaign, and this one would just be another. They were the famed 74th Regiment, after all, a part of the 1st Brigade under General Lacambre's battle-hardened division. They would not lose this fight. After the disastrous Spanish defeat at the Battle of Binacayan, last November 11, 1896, the Spanish colonial government and army went through various changes. The most important of these changes was the appointment of Lieutenant General Camilo Polavieja as Governor General of the Philippines, replacing Lieutenant General Ramon Blanco, who left for Spain in December 30, 1896. Along with this, a major reassignment of commanders occurred, with the newly arrived Major General Jose Lacambre being appointed as the commander of the division in charge of Laguna, Batangas, and Tayabas, and Moro campaign veteran General Diego de los Rios being reassigned as commander of the brigade at Central Luzon. In addition to this, various expeditionary reinforcements were continuously coming in from Spain. These expeditionary forces were comprised of volunteer European soldiers, equipped with modern Spanish Mauser model 1893 rifle. By the start of 1897, over 11,000 European soldiers have arrived in the Philippines. Augmenting this force was the original Philippine garrison of 1,500 European soldiers, 6,000 native Filipino soldiers, and around 1,000 native volunteers. All in all, there would have been a force of 19,000 600 Spanish soldiers available to hold the Philippines and suppress the rebellion. In this force, 12,500 were European and 7,000 were native Filipino. This marks the first time a Spanish army in the Philippines had more European soldiers than native Filipino soldiers. With high numbers of men, large stores of supplies, and good dry weather for the first few months of 1897, Governor General Polavieja believed that it was the perfect time for a new campaign against the rebels in Cavite. Ever since the start of August 1896, the Katipunan-led revolution at Cavite had won a string of victories, which ultimately dislodged a majority of Spanish forces in the province aside from a few small fortress garrisons near the coast. A failed attempt to recapture the lost province ended up with the disastrous Battle of Binacayan, which achieved nothing but boost the morale of the rebels. From this safe stronghold, rebel forces were able to gather and strengthen their stance in the south, as well as threaten the colonial capital of Manila, which was just to the province's north. By 1897, Cavite's Katipunan factions in the province were reinforced by the forces of Andres Bonifacio, the leader of the Katipunan. Retreating from the north, he linked up with the forces in Cavite, which at that point were successfully holding off Spanish attempts to break their lines. Now, however, with a larger force, General Polavieja planned to renew the offensive and break the backbone of the rebellion. With a new campaign, Governor General Polavieja hoped to crush the whole rebellion and restore order throughout the colony. Already, General de los Rios was making headway at Central Luzon, with his brigade pushing back rebel forces and accepting the surrender of large numbers of them. With such good news coming from the north, the failures of the previous year seemed to be slowly replaced with victories of the renewed Spanish effort. Because of this, 
General Polo Vieja knew it was time to bring the same victories to the south so that they could return Spanish authority in the area as well as wash away the disasters and shame that had been stained by blood in Cavite. Furthermore, a victory in Cavite would not only relieve the rebel threat to Manila but it might quite possibly also end the rebellion itself. All in all, the Cambres division had within it a total of 13,580 men. Against this force was the divided rebel Katipunan force, separated between the commands of the Magdalo and the Magdiwang factions. Since the start of the revolution, two factions of the Katipunan ruled over Cavite. One was the Magdalo, based at the town of Kawit, the other was the Magdiwang, based at Noveleta. As the revolution grew, with more men being recruited and territories being captured by both factions, the two groups soon started butting heads with one another as they tried to gain more and more influence in the province. Despite being under the same organization, which was the Katas Taasan Kagalanggalangang Katipunan ng Mga Anak ng Bayan, or Katipunan for short, the two factions still tried to compete for more power. Because of this, Cavite was divided between two governing powers, with those areas led by the Magdalo and those areas led by the Magdiwang. Forming up his brigades, La Cambre bombarded the town with artillery and rifle fire. In response, rebel forces fired back with what they can. Soon, there was a firefight between the two forces as the rebels, under the command of General Vito Bellarmino, desperately tried to defend the town. The whole firefight was said to last for nearly five hours. On the 20th, an advance made by the 1st Casadores Battalion managed to capture the first two trenches in the rebel lines. This was followed up by the general attack against the town, with Spanish forces fixing bayonets on their rifles and charging the rebel positions. Pablo Galan, who was serving in the 2nd Company of the 2nd Casadores Battalion, recounts the charge as follows. The 50,000 men then entered Silang with, armed with bayonets, running through the streets after the rebels. We reached the convent and, once the rebels surrendered, the Spanish flag was hoisted to the music of Cadiz. We had to take all the trenches at bayonet point. As soon as the rebels saw us position the bayonets and heard the trumpet, groups of four scuttled here and there. Fearing the bayonet, but fearing the Spaniards more, the rebels ran. Casualties for the Spanish were low, with them receiving only 12 killed and 70 wounded. The rebel force, however, was devastated by the battle, with them losing 500 killed and 1,500 wounded. Despite holding the town, La Cambre's brigades would encounter daily firefights against the enemy as the rebels harassed the Spanish force. On February 22, forces under General Emilio Aguinaldo and Colonel Crisostomo Riel attacked Silang in an attempt to recapture it. Fighting would continue till the next day, with the Spanish still firmly in place. However, sporadic rifle fire was still encountered by the Spanish up to the resumption of their advance on the 25th. Defeated, General Aguinaldo would fall back towards Imus where he would prepare his defenses there. Before leaving Silang, General Lacambre ordered the whole town to be burnt down. The only building spared by his force was the church and convent, which was used as a garrison for the two companies left behind, as well as a hospital for the wounded. Once at Salitran, the division made camp for a couple of days before beginning the assault on Imus on the 24th. Unfortunately for General Lacambre, the strong trench line at Pasong Santol, which they had fought over last March 7, had been reoccupied by the native rebels. This rebel force was initially commanded by General Emilio Aguinaldo, but halfway through the battle, he was replaced by his elder brother, 
General Crispolo Aguinaldo, as the former head had been elected earlier that day as president of the revolutionary government. By this time, the two factions at Cavite had finally agreed to form a revolutionary government, which resulted with Emilio Aguinaldo being elected as president. Hesitant at first, he declined an earlier offer by Colonel, Colonel Vicente Riego de Dios to leave his command to a subordinate as he needed to take his oath of office. He was only convinced to leave by his brother, who promised to take over the defense of Pasong Santol. Crispulo Aguinaldo promised Emilio that the only Spanish could take the defense was over his dead body. Trusting his brother, he agreed to transfer the command to him. Emilio Aguinaldo left Pasong Santol and traveled to Tejeros, the site of the oath-taking. Although the creation of a revolutionary government unified the rebellion, it also deprived them of a valuable field commander. Forced to make another frontal attack against it, La Cambre once more deployed his infantry in the line of battle, this time accompanied by a battery of mountain guns. Like before, the rebel position was well fortified, and as the Spanish brigade formed up, they knew that they were in for a fight. Once more, a hail of rifle fire greeted the Spanish force as General Marina moved the battle line to 300 yards from the trench. There, he deployed the artillery and ordered it to bombard the enemy line. Entangled in a firefight, the two forces slugged out against each other until a breach in the rebel trenches was achieved. Seeing this opening, General Marina ordered a charge and quickly Spanish troops began concentrating on the breach, bayonets fixed and ready to fight in close quarters. Ready to meet them, the rebel native Filipinos held their bolos tightly and soon engaged the assaulting Spanish soldiers. The fight was intense and heavy, but in the end the rebels retreated, enabling the division to capture the trench line. However, Spanish casualties were high this time with 9 dead and 108 wounded. The rebels also suffered greatly, with 300 dead, among them being General Crispolo Aguinaldo. A rebel battalion from Naik was said to have been on its way to reinforce the defenders at Pasong Santol, but it was stopped by General Ricarte, the elected Captain General of the Revolutionary Army. After the battle, the division rested before resuming the advance towards Imus but they only advanced for two miles before halting and making camp. They would continue on March 25 and would soon encounter another entrenched position. Once more, the enemy trenches were formidable, with strong mounds of earth protecting their troops. Deploying the division, La Cambre decided to attack both the center and flanks. Advancing forward, the Spanish force awaited the customary hail of rifle fire, but were surprised to receive none. Unbeknownst to them, the rebels were waiting for them to be within 200 yards of the trench before opening fire. Once they were close enough, a heavy volley of rifle fire and lantaka shots erupted and hit the advancing Spanish force. Once more, the battle led to heavy fighting, and through their best efforts, the division was able to capture the rebel trenches, killing 600 of them. Not allowing this to delay them, La Cambre continued the movement towards Imus. Rallying at the town, rebels tried to make a stand but routed at the site at the approaching division. Unable to hold the line, the rebel forces started burning houses before blowing up the arsenal there in hopes of slowing down the Spanish advance. This action managed to slow down the center force. However, the division's flanks were still able to move forward and enfilade the retreating rebels. In the end, the rebels lost 800 more men. Entering the bur burnt town, General Lacambre noted the achievements of the 74th Native Infantry Regiment throughout the day's battle and the whole campaign and ordered that their colors be proudly flown from atop the church at Imus. By the end of the day, the division was victorious but exhausted. This was one of the heaviest fighting they have encountered, which should have been expected as Imus was a crucial town for the Katipunan's Magdalo faction. For their part in the battle, the division lost 25 men killed 
and 119 wounded. For the next few days, the Spanish forces at Noveleta would be harassed by rebel attacks, but none came close to dislodging them. On April 6, Nakambre's division left Noveleta and moved towards San Francisco de Malabon. The march, however, was a difficult one as rebel forces had flooded the rice fields in front of their lines. Because of this, the artillery and baggage train had difficulty to move forward as enemy skirmishers took shots at the force. Realizing that the position they were was in a difficult one, General Lacambre maneuvered his units so that they would attack the enemy held down from the flanks, where drier ground could be found. Upon reaching dry, dry ground, Lacambre quickly deployed his artillery and began bombarding the rebel lines. Adding to this was the infantry who poured in volleys of rifle fire at the rebels. After a sufficient bombardment, Lacambre soon ordered an assault which was led by the native infantry regiments. Deciding to hold their ground, the rebels got on top of their trenches and let loose volleys of rifle fire at the charging native regiments. Undeterred, the native infantry continued on with their assault, soon slamming into the rebels and fighting them hand to hand. After an intense and heavy battle, the native infantry managed to kill 120 rebels while forcing the rest to retreat. Reforming the regiments, the division made an attempt to pursue the rebels but were greatly delayed when the rebels began burning houses to cover their retreat. Some rebels were, however, caught by the advancing Spanish forces and it was reported that a further 400 were killed. The division, on the other hand, lost 25 killed and 125 wounded. In the next few days, Santa Cruz de Malabon and Rosario would be captured without a fight. With all the rebel strongholds now under Spanish occupation and the, enti the entirety of Cavite now back under Spanish control, the offensive and campaign was now finally over. For La Cambre and his division, the whole operation at Cavite was a victorious one, ending with the capture of the vital rebel centers of control. In the 52 days of campaigning, La Cambre's division were, was able to retake the entirety of Cavite while suffering the loss of one general, 14 officers and 168 men killed and 56 officers and 910 wounded. Throughout the offensive, the whole division managed to distinguish themselves as an elite fighting force, able to capture any objective they were ordered to take. Thanks to the leadership of officers like General Lacambre, Arison, and Marina, the men of the division charged forward even against heavily fortified defenses. It was because of this division that Cavite was returned to the Spanish Empire's control. However, it did not end the rebellion as General Polavieja hoped it would. Escaping the Spanish attempt to crush the rebellion, President Emilio Aguinaldo managed to slip past the, enemy, the Spanish lines and move northward, where he would entrench himself in the nearly impregnable lands at Biak na Bato, Bulacan. From there, he would continue the rebellion and lead the revolutionary government until a treaty was signed later that year. Despite not being the game-ending offensive that it was hoped to be, the La Cambre offensive was still a great military feat, one that restored the Spanish army's honor, especially after the disastrous defeats of 1896. It could be said that it was one of the last great campaigns of the Spanish Empire. The rebellion at Cavite who were once thought undefeatable in their fortress province, was brought down by the determined efforts of General Lacambre and his division.